You are welcome to this preview of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 for those who lead Bible study groups. Reading from the New Revised Standard Version Bible of 2022, including manuscript variants in green type. We are in the midst of the Apostle Paul's second missionary journey following his three weeks in Thessalonica, from whence he fled to Athens and then to Corinth. He composed this letter to the Thessalonians to answer a number of questions and address issues that came up during Timothy's visit back to Thessalonica. In this lesson, we shall try to find out when Jesus will return, and secondly, how we should live until then. We're following the semantic structure suggested by Robert Stirner, which consists of a greeting, we thank God for your faith, love, and hope. God wants you to remain pure and to do good. You learned this from our instruction. God wants you to be holy now and at his coming. This includes moral and ethical purity. This includes hope of resurrection. So we appeal to you to keep doing good as a body. And may the God of peace sanctify you entirely with a final greeting. This lesson will cover these let points. Watch. So, let us watch for the Lord's coming. Have someone in your Bible study group read aloud verses 1, 2, and 3. Have someone suggest a better translation of the Hendiades, the times and the seasons. Point out that times and seasons in the Bible include the day of mankind, the long age in which demons rule over human empires, the end of days, when the Son of Man arrives, raising the dead. Of course, he has come, and so we are now in the end of days. But there is still coming the day of Yahweh, the day of the Lord, when God will save the righteous, defeat the wicked, and restore Eden on earth. The day of the Lord. The Hebrew prophets wrote about a future time when the God of Israel would save Israel from its enemies, punish Gentile nations, and set up his own rule over the entire world. We suggest that you cite one or two examples from the Dead Sea Scrolls of Jewish writers who shared this same teaching. We suggest that you cite one or two examples from the Dead Sea Scrolls of Jewish writers who shared the same teaching up until the time of Jesus, and examples from the New Testament from Jesus' apostles who adopted the idea of a coming day of the Lord in their writings. Here are some examples from the Hebrew prophets of coming woe, of deliverance, and of worldwide rule. From the Apocrypha, you might cite this text. And from the Dead Sea Scrolls, these passages. And from the New Testament, these verses. Pose this query for discussion in your group. How will world affairs appear at the start of the day of the Lord? Note the phrase, peace and security. And then ask, what will the day of the Lord bring to those who are of the night, of darkness? The reply should cite the phrase, sudden destruction. Have someone read aloud verses 4, 5, and 6. Then ask, who will be surprised by the day of the Lord, and why? Then ask, who will not be surprised by the day of the Lord? And why not? You might note that dualistic categories such as light and darkness, day and night, righteous and unrighteous, are typical of poetic and apocalyptic language. As an example, cite Proverb 4, 18 and 19. Have someone read aloud verses 8, 9, and 10. Pose this query for discussion. To what has God destined those who have faith in Jesus Christ? 
they should easily find that we are destined for salvation from God's wrath through Jesus Christ, for we will live with him. And then discuss, to what has God destined those who have no faith in Christ? Which, of course, includes the coming wrath. This might be a good time to review a number of perspectives found amongst Christians, ancient and modern, regarding future events. The most, the, the most the simplistic most. view, which we call the naive popular view, says that during this present age on earth, there are good souls and bad souls, and that at death, good souls will go into heaven and bad souls will go into hell or some imaginary purgatory. A fuller yet popular view includes the Christian hope, wherein good souls will eventually rise back to life and bad souls will rise and be sent into shame. The so-called general resurrection often leaves unclear what will happen on earth. Serious. Views that take as serious a future kingdom may still hold to a general resurrection leading into Christ's kingdom on earth. Millennial theories add to this a 1,000 year or very long age before the heavenly city will descend down onto earth. And a variant of this position we call pre-tribulationism, which says that a three and a half or seven year period of intense persecution will follow a secret resurrection called rapture. Others say the resurrection will occur in the middle of such a tribulation period. And if you say, oh no, the resurrection will happen after the seven-year period of intense persecution. Currently, in the 21st century, serious Bible students are returning to an emphasis upon the biblical concept of the day of the Lord, which will be followed by a reign of Christ on the earth, of which the so-called millennium is only the first thousand years. Read aloud verse 11. Have someone retranslate the Hendiades, encourage and build up. You might note that the verb to build up is borrowed from the Greek Septuagint version of the Hebrew Bible and cite as an example Jeremiah 40 verse 7. Note the grammar of this passage. These are present tense imperatives, which you could paraphrase, keep on adding to each other's faith, love, and hope, and then discuss how to do so. As you continue, we suggest that you take the analytical chart from chapter 4 and note how it relates to the coming day of the Lord. First, we have the present age in which we believe and many of us are passing away to be followed by the day of the Lord, which will include his coming, the resurrection of the dead, our joining him in the clouds, our meeting with him, and our return with him to earth. Note that the day of the Lord includes both our salvation from the wrath to come and then the time of wrath upon the godless nations. We appeal to you to keep doing good as a body. Have someone read verses 12 and 13. If your group members have a sense of history, you might note that historians have shown that it was the relatively better off and those with relatively higher social status who could afford to toil and care for the community at their own expense, reason for which they were to be highly esteemed. So, we appeal to you to keep doing good as a body. Continuing with verses 12 and 13, we make these notes about New Testament leadership. 
the epistles speak of leaders as elders, not as priests. These elders are of two types. There are the overseers, those who have speaking gifts and provide leadership, and there are the deacons, who have equal rank as elders, who have service gifts, and ensure the timely meeting of needs within the membership. It may be worth noting that elders have duties to take care of us, but they possess no divine authority. They are not our boss. Nevertheless, we are to maintain godly attitudes towards our church leaders. The term we esteem is a form of the verb that literally translates to let ourselves be led by them. So we esteem them highly in love because of their work. Secondly, we seek to maintain peaceful relations amongst ourselves and with our leaders. So, what could go wrong? Well, we might become jealous, take offense, become disrespectful, or just dislike them. And they, for their part, may feel insecure they may actually be incompetent or have an attitude of superiority. Nevertheless, they do enjoy a certain derived authority from three sources. First, if your churches are registered with the state, then your leaders become clergy and legal officers of the corporation or of your anonymous society. Otherwise, your churches may have established an ecclesial hierarchy by which men appoint and empower your leaders. In many cultures of the world, there is a social convention, what anthropologists call the patron-client relationship, which is still a dominant cultural structure in many countries, whereby the wealthy and powerful take care of the members and the members, in turn, vote for, support, and show respect for their patrons. Read aloud. Have someone read aloud verses 14 and 15. How does this happen in weekly services? Most members will readily admit that it does not. For services consist mostly in one or two individuals who talk a lot, whilst others sit passively listening or thinking about other things. So then ask this, where can these things more likely be done? And talk about the various fellowship groups, small groups, home churches, and action groups that you have formed. Read aloud. Have someone read aloud verses 16, 17, and 18. And then read this rather long query. How can we rejoice or give thanks whilst globalists are setting up a new world order, banks are sucking up our real wealth, governments are promoting sexual perversion, armies are invading countries, death rates are rising unnaturally, adults are succumbing to strong narcotics in public, government schools are now teaching lies about race relations. And lastly, verses 19 through 21. Time permitting, you might discuss, how might we quench God's Spirit? This relates to query two. What are prophecies? Read 1 Corinthians 14, 3, 24 and 26. What criteria apply to prophecies? from verses 27 through 29. After examining those verses, discuss together what makes for a good prophecy and what makes for a worthless or evil prophecy. Or evil prophecy. Finish with verses 23 and 24. Your whole being. This includes our inner being, our social self, and our psychological well-being. This phrase has given rise to certain theories amongst theologians. 
Some who talk about the human person consisting of body, soul, and spirit, or others suggesting there is only body and spirit, and where these intersect, you are a living soul. You are not required to adopt any of these theories. You might conclude your time together by reading verses 25 through 28, a wonderful blessing.